What's up, everyone? This is an all-new Baltimore, Maryland episode of One-on-Ones with Mike and Paul, and we have a special guest with us I'm going to get to in a second, but it is Baltimore, Maryland at Sammy's Trattoria, uh, a family friend of ours. We're here celebrating the annual Pro Lacrosse Hall of Fame class. There's four inductees. We have a huge weekend of our four games that include our junior championships. Baltimore has become a staple for us, and as such, we, uh, we were thinking a lot about this week's podcast and introducing a new guest that's not a player, um, but a valuable partner like players are, and she is the CEO of Cenogenics. Uh, her name is Christy Berry, and Cenogetics is a new league partner. They're our executive wellness partner. We'll talk a lot about sort of mind, body, spirit. Uh, we're going to talk about business and uh, drink some wine, and you're here with your family. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. It's, it's truly an honor to be here and to really be part of what you guys have created and are continuing to create and evolve around lacrosse and the the professional level of the PLL and really what you've brought to the game, to the players, to the industry, I think is just such um, an amazing alignment really with what Cenogenics is all about too. It's about high performance teams. It's about creating value. It's about really investing in your people and making them the best that they can be. And so, you know, this partnership from my perspective has been incredible and it was just a no-brainer really when um when we connected to say yes let's make something happen yeah we're going to talk about the connectivity between wellness and professional athletes and then where that message can be spread to the rest of the general population in a really authentic way uh, but lacrosse and thinking about that first zoom we had you knew all about it your daughter plays at jacksonville yes. you guys are coming in from georgia yes. we were talking a little bit before we started recording like there's such a growth in participation in the state of Georgia. You'd even mention more on the girls' side than on the boys' side. We started talking about coaches and stuff. Talk about your relationship to lacrosse, maybe when you first saw it, when you first maybe tried it or, you know, so it, it's, take us through <laughs> so it. So I'm uh, right up front. I've never played a sport in my life. I was, I, I didn't, my, my brother played sports, my husband played every sport imaginable. Um, and so raising our girls, um, you know, we knew the importance of sports and really how that can help develop a young person into adulthood and all the benefits that come with it. And our younger daughter um, decided in um, elementary school that she wanted to try lacrosse. And I thought, okay, well, I'm gonna have to learn what that is. <laughs> and so she, we went to you know one of those kind of secondhand stores, picked up some gear, sent her out for her first clinic, and watched her and thought, gosh, she hates it. And she walked off that field <laughs> with a big smile and holding her stick, and she goes, I love lacrosse. Oh, she loved. Well, loved. well she's here, so let's get a first uh, firsthand account. Tell us about that first. You love it. Um, first practice. I went out and I just bought a stick from, oh gosh. Played again Played sports. again. Yeah, played <laughs> it again was. sports. I had like those neon cleats and. Big goofy I, goggles. Big <laughs> green goggles and a huge mouth guard. I went out and the first thing they tried to teach us was cradling. And I could not figure out how to move the stick without right. the ball falling out. Um, but all the girls in line were like, trust me, it gets easier. It gets easier because there was like experienced players there. And so at the end, I actually got the hang of cradling finally. And I was like, oh my God, like that was my moment of, okay, it's like not that bad. And I came off and they're both sitting there. They're like, How, like how'd you do? Like, how'd you like it? And I was like, this is me. I was like, this is so <laughs> me. This is where I want to be. Um, I figured out cradling. That was like my big thing. It's like, I need to figure out how to cradle. Everything else, I can figure it out. But it's a, uh, thank you for that. It's yeah. a really, uh, it's satisfying, isn't it? That, that we, when, before we launched PLL Assist, which is the league's nonprofit, we had a family foundation called the Rabel Foundation, and we worked with uh, children with learning differences and their schools in the broader Maryland region around starting lacrosse programs. And a woman who was the head of the lab school, which is where our sister went to, and Mike and I grew up with our own learning challenges, uh, which is partly the inspiration, uh, she said, man, I just love lacrosse, the trial and error component of it. Our students get on with it. 
So perhaps it's a matter of continuing on and persistence, but at every turn you learn your cradle, you can miss a ball and pick it up. You know, a pass is, is, is a completion, is statted well, an assist, a goal. Like it's, it's very complex, but also very team oriented and personally oriented, like your own equipment. You do, you tape your stick the way you want it. That's yours. You don't show up to the football field and use the same pigskin that everyone else has. Uh, what, so why didn't you play sports? Was it by choice or? <laughs> Great question. Um, I, so I will qualify that. I did ballet when I was very young. Oh, fantastic. Um, so that is a sport um, in its own right. But um, You know who trained in ballet for the back half of their career? Yes. Kobe Bryant? Yes, I know. Yeah. I know. I think that is so cool. I mean, I, look, it, it's about, it, so for me, my story, right? It's. I did ballet, I, it just, I don't know. I don't know for whatever reason, it just didn't really stick with me, something that I wanted to continue to pursue. Were you more focused on school? You I was very focused and... into school. And honestly, I, I knew from a very young age that I wanted to be big. I wanted to make, you know, I, I used to tell my parents, I want to be rich. You know, in my mind, that's what it meant, right? It was like, yeah. I want to be rich. <laughs> I want to do something that's super successful. I want to be able to make my own decisions. I want to go and do however I choose. And I realized, you know, I've got to work hard for that. And so I did, I focused it on school. I was a great student in school. And that was really my, my focus and my passion. So when I had girls, I knew that, you know, certainly there's that path, but having, you know, my husband's influence of growing up playing sports and seeing and understanding the benefit of it, I really encouraged it. And so that's what got us into lacrosse actually. And in our community, um, it's really much more popular for the girls and the boys at younger ages. And Georgia, it's the South, it didn't have a huge lacrosse um, presence, and, but they were trying to build it. You could just see they're trying to build it. And so by the time she got into middle school, they started a club program outside of the high school. And they were looking for volunteers. And I know I couldn't be a coach, but I, I just loved the sport. Like when I, once I learned it, I was like, wow, I get it. I understand it. I saw the joy that it brought my daughter. I saw it bringing the kids together in the community. And so I volunteered to be the athletic director of the youth oh, wow. lacrosse program. So I served in that role um, for almost three years and then stayed connected once she moved into high school with the program to help reinforce that kind of like feeder system from that transition through middle school into high school to keep that love of the game, to really keep the connection between the younger girls and the older girls so that they wanted to continue to pursue this as you know, something into their future. That's amazing. So just listening to you talk, you're, you're a doer, you're an operator, right? You saw an opportunity to help the youth program. You're like, I'm just gonna be the director and help this thing. Um, and then also reading about your background. Uh, and, and also hearing you talk about doing something big. I would love to hear a little bit. I think it's really interesting for our audience to hear about. Um, you started at Synagenics as a coordinator. So like front lines, meeting the customers that they've come in, you know, sort of entry level position and you've risen through the ranks, helped build the company and now you're the CEO. Can you talk a little bit about that journey? What kept you with the company? How you made that switch? Why, why did you want to stick with the company and what allowed you to scale up into your current position? Yeah. So I will start that story with Cenogenics is my legacy at this stage. Like it really is my legacy. And it is that way because of how I started. So I have always had a passion for helping people. Like I've always wanted to help people however I could. And my grandma was a nurse. And so I thought, you know what, I'll be a nurse. And so when I graduated high school, I went into college and needed to be accepted to the nursing program and started that. And then I was working um, outside of that at some um, different healthcare clinics, worked with children and so on and so forth. And a friend of mine introduced me to Cenogenics in 1999. So the company was founded in 97. And in 99, she said, you know, I really think this is something that might be of interest to you. It's new. It's hard to pronounce the name. <laughs> Not quite sure what they do. It's super new, but um, it's 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 in the vein of helping people. So, I started as the very first patient services coordinator, um, so entry level, and I had a really unique and rare opportunity to, uh, about two months in, have an exchange with the former founder and CEO at the time, and our CFO was out of town. There was a VIP patient that something occurred and he just picked me out of the office. He's like, you come help me. 
And so I got to work alongside of him on the business side of things. And I got to see something I wouldn't have otherwise seen in my current role. And I worked through it, solved it, all was good. And he said, you know what? I see something in you. He's like, you know, I'd like to kind of bring you in on more things. And so he really started to mentor me throughout my time at Cenogenics. So that was in 99. Uh, by 2005, I was promoted to COO. The running joke at the company is I've been promoted like a thousand times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I've, I've, I've served in every role but the physician role. Um, and so I, you know, by 2005 was COO. And really that was the start of our strategic de decision to kind of expand broadly and really look at how do we have a national footprint because there was more and more growing awareness around longevity and age management medicine. You know, when I first started, it was very taboo. Um, I kind of refer to it as like plastic surgery in the 70s. You know, people really didn't talk about it. They just kind of went away for a few weeks, came back looking a little different. And so that is um, really the, the genesis of kind of like how I started into the organization. And from there, you know, helped us expand 22 locations today across the US, seven international. I was the one out there, you know, rolling up my sleeves, setting up our offices, training the staff, um, really just making sure that we're executing on the promise that we make to our patients. And in 2020, there was a transaction that occurred and our former founder and CEO stepped aside and I moved into the CEO role. So I've been CEO for the last four years. Mm, amazing journey. And, and it, frankly, it's a lot like an athlete there and and the commitment the endurance the work ethic the the willingness to take risks and uh the loyalty yeah yeah you know, and so. I, that that's one thing it's um I, I think it's so important in whatever you choose to do right find your passion find what drives you it's not always going to be easy it's oftentimes not going to be easy but if you enjoy it and you love it and you know that it's not only giving you satisfaction, but for me, I'm helping people. I am really creating just transformational experiences for the population today that, you know, struggles. Like your health and well-being is something that is at the forefront that traditional medicine doesn't give the right attention to. It's focused on, you know, disease and treating disease. Recovery. Re exactly. And rehabilitation. And it's, it's be preventive prevent it, delay it, um, you know, even, um, be you know, proactive. Be, exactly. Yeah. That's what it's all about. So I have a question for you on the brand side. So you mentioned that modern medicine was sort of taboo, mm -hmm. like plastic surgery. We could look all the way back to prohibition and, and alcohol in this country. And then today's version of the, you know, the, the, the medicine plant of CBD and THC. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a number of other things that we look at. Politics largely pushes like kind of mass brand messaging. How was Cenogenics and sort of your industry able to shift the perception of modern medicine to get to a place where we are today? You know, it comes down to just education, educating the population, educating people about what is possible teaching people that you don't have to settle for the ailments that you might feel or the diseases that you might get. And so it was, it was no easy task, right? Because you're, you're competing with traditional medicine. And so we founded a nonprofit organization um, that focuses on training and educating physicians from all over the world. And we created a program where we will bring in physicians that recognize that there's a need for this and that they want to do something different that they weren't taught in medical school, that they're not doing in their everyday physician job. And so they come in, they would train with us, they would go back out into their practices and um, you know, start incorporating things that we were doing. And that's really how we went from one location to 22 locations and built you know, this massive you know, physician network and offering is because the growing awareness. And so it's, it's, it all ties back to that. The other thing I'll say is, Everything we do is clinically based. It's science-based, evidence-based. So that has been true to our core foundation from day one. Um, there are so many shiny new objects that are popping up, you know, at all different times, right? And especially in our two plus decade lifespan here at Cenogenics. And it's so easy to get caught up in that. And I think human nature oftentimes is like, give me the easiest thing, the quickest fix, the single source miracle. And we, 
stay true to that value of making sure that how is it going to benefit the patient? What is that outcome going to be? And that is really just what built the credibility in the space. And so I oftentimes refer to it as, um, you know, we're, we're cutting edge, right? We're always innovating. You've got, to, you've got things change, people evolve, technologies evolve, but we're not bleeding edge. Um, we don't go across that line because we want to make sure that everything that we're doing is clinically um, sound. The, uh, the thing you're talking about, especially around getting the message out and the education, I'm interested in, you know, uh, Paul and I think a lot about um, making sure we're providing, you know, as co-founders, uh, a value set and making sure that we're driving the company forward. And our, a lot of it's like, you know, uh, our DNA of performance. And I'm interested in, as you talk about some of the things you've done to sort of build that J curve of, of sort of be more acceptable in, in the space of longevity and how the space has changed. Are there any, like, uh, you mentioned the founder, he sort of took you under his wing and mentored you. Are there any values that he had uh, that you really hold true today in your work as a CEO, like DNA that he had that you're really trying to pull through and making sure that uh, that sort of that sort of standards continue to be set? Yeah, um, first and foremost, we're a family. Cenogenics is a family. And I think that that if we take care of our people internally, they're going to take care of our patients externally. And it just bleeds through the organization. And that is first and foremost. Um, excellence, whether it's clinical excellence or operational excellence, always striving to do the best, always making sure that you know what that North Star is and you're guiding towards it at all times. Um, I also think, um, you know, I don't, I don't know if I want to say imagination or innovation, that you, you can become so stale, right? It's so easy to get caught up in like what you always do, what you believe, what you know, you've got to get outside of that. You've got to think outside of the box. You've got to read more articles. You've got to do more training sessions. You've got to meet new people, have new experiences, because that's how you're going to continue to grow as a person and really as a company, to understand like the needs that are um, needing to be met by all of those around you. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about the partnership for a second. So we, we have our executive wellness component because as we know, performing at a high level requires a lot of energy, um, mind and spirit, physicality, and a lot of travel. And so you all helping us and our executive team stay on top of it is really critical. The pass-through messaging for me is going to be with the impact that a company like Cenogenics can have on athlete performance. And as the general population looks at athletes who are top class and the way that they perform, why not them as well or learn from them? And so a couple of examples I'll share is VO2 max, which I've done. And, and uh, I, rem I remember learning about it probably 10 years ago as a, uh, the primary testing that was done in European football to determine an athlete's fitness level and more importantly, ways to unlock better fitness. And so what you learn when you do, and there's now evolved versions of testing for your VO2 max, but at the time when I did it, I was doing essentially a beep test on a treadmill and had a, a mask connected to me and then blood was drawn in between, every, uh, in, in between every segment. And what I learned was how my body uses its fuel at different stages. So it allowed me to address my diet and my diet before games and around games and after games. The other component is fitness level, which, you know, athletes our age growing up were like, how much, how much weight can you bench press and how long can you run for? When in reality, conditioning comes to how quickly your heart rate can rest. And you should be targeting as a strength and conditioning coach with your athletes the turnaround time it takes from getting to 172 beats per minute on a hard routine back to 124, call it. And then you go again versus arbitrarily saying three minute rest period. So all of this like kind of uh, data oriented, but evolution of the way that athletes can train so that they can be perform better is a part of what you guys do. 100%. And um, I oftentimes use the analogy, um, you know, speaking to the, these high performance athletes, speaking to the three of us sitting around this table, we're Ferraris, 
right? And it's a beautiful, amazing, intense car. But if you don't know what's under the hood, you don't know what's going on with it, it's just a shell. And it's not gonna run great, it's not gonna perform well. And so really being able to get under the hood and look at what's working, what needs to change, what levels need to be optimized is really critical. And you don't just take your Ferrari to any you know, car shop no. on the corner, you take it to a specialist. And you don't give it regular unleaded fuel. You don't. Yeah. And so that's what makes Cenogenics so powerful is because we, we wrote the textbook in age management medicine. We are the pioneers of this space. Nobody was doing this in 1997. Our physicians are trained to go in, look at all of the blood biomarkers that we um, evaluate, look at all of these diagnostic testing and the metrics we're getting out of that, pull it all together and really come up with a very personalized approach to you, to you, myself. Everybody is different. And that is why our program is so successful, is because patients get outcomes that are just far beyond anything that you would ever get in a traditional setting because we've personalized it. We know everything that's working. And it's not just one or two things. You have to put it all together. You have to really understand how that body or that car or that engine is working to make it fully optimized. Yeah, and I'm, I imagine that if you look at the, the space now, uh, and you're interested in longevity, you're interested in health and wellness, there's a lot of different talking heads on social media and, and they're providing value. But I find, you know, whether you're watching like Gary Brecka or Andrew Huberman or Peter Atia, it's like they're all sort of unpacking one little situation, but it's like three hours and you're like, what should I follow? Should I follow him or him or her? What, like, what can someone who's like, okay, I'm interested in this journey. I'm interested in my health and wellness. I'm interested in like, you know, getting a read on where I sit and then making imp improvements. How do you think about the customer journey? Like someone listening to this, what is the experience for them? What should they do if they want to start this journey? And what can they hopefully try to expect working with Cenogenics? So I think the, the first thing to do is you, somebody who wants to take accountability and become like the CEO of their body, that's step one. Like if you want to know and you want to better yourself, you have like, that, that's the toughest piece of it, right? Once you do that with Cenogenics, coming into our program, we're going to bring you in, we're going to create an experience for you that is very convenient, that's seamless. We are there to partner with you on this journey because it's a lifestyle choice. This is not a quick fix. This is not a do it for six months and then go back to what you were doing before. This is very much about partnering with you because as you age, as things in your life change, as you know, your family dynamics change or your professional dynamics change, that's having an impact on your body. And so we're going to work with you along the way to tweak things and make sure that you're staying optimized. So you will go through that blood um, serum test that I mentioned. We'll send a phlebotomist to your home or office to draw your blood. We will then bring you into one of our locations and put you through a series of diagnostic testing. You'll spend four to six hours with us. I mean, it's, it's really intense time, but the amount of information and data that we're able to gather during that time is incredible. You're gonna meet with a performance health coach. That's your coach. It's somebody that you're gonna to talk to, not only that day, but going forward. You're going to have a personalized exercise program, a personalized nutrition program. And then you get to sit down with your physician and pull all of that data together, all of those learnings, talk about what are your goals? What are you looking to achieve today, next year, three years, five years down the road? What is your family history? Maybe there's something that, you know, maybe your father had a heart attack at, you know, 47 and you're approaching 47 and you've got that kind of like fear monger in your head. Let us help you figure out how to make sure that you're doing everything possible to prevent that from being you. And that partnership and that journey is something that we really pride ourselves on. When was the last time either one of you spent two hours with a physician outside of Cynogenics, yeah. outside of your Cynogenics <laughs> experience? Yeah. How many, I, it's unheard of. You don't get that kind of time with a physician who specializes in this. Right. And so at the end of your day, you're gonna go back home and it's like, then what? So kind of to your point, they give you chunks of information, but then what? We come together with our pharmacy partners, our nutraceutical manufacturers, our lab partners, and we pull together a program that's personalized for you. So whatever it is you need, we're then going to 
send that to you, facilitate that for you all behind the scenes, very white glove experience. And you're not having to go to your local pharmacy every month to pick up your prescriptions. They're shipping to your home or office. Um, we're gonna send that phlebotomist back to your home or office to do that blood draw once a quarter because we wanna know how are things working. And if you need anything, you call your team. It's very concierge-like um, because we want to be there for you in those difficult situations. You're sitting down to a business dinner. What do I eat? Take a picture of your menu, send it to your health coach. So no pasta tonight. You know what? All <laughs> everything in moderation. <laughs> everything in moderation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Little, it, is it, it is red wine. It is red wine. A <laughs> little bit of, in moderate, and that's that's the key, right? This is a lifestyle change. If we told everybody you can't drink wine, you can't eat pasta, you have to work out, you know, six days a week, how long is that sustainable yeah. for most people? It's it's difficult, and so we want to make sure that we're creating. Um, digestible goals and lifestyle changes and creating new habits that you can sustain for the rest of your life. It's very much about having an increased health span as you age. You know, you've probably heard the terms lifespan versus health span. People that have an increased health span are able to stay active, do all the things that they love well into their older years. They're not, you know, stuck in a nursing home. They're not in and out of the hospital. They're not on, you know, 25 different medications because of their blood pressure. It's about staying active and doing so until the day it's time for you to not be here. Yeah. And that's what Senogenics is really all about. So we partner with you to help you fulfill that and make your success story whatever you want it to be and whatever you want it to be. Well, I would say just as a testament to, of course, working with, the best athletes in the world. One of the notes too is like the conversation around the LeBron James and a Serena Williams and even Simone Biles now, the first gymnast to win the all around older than 20, she's 27. So people go like, well, what is it? I think it's attention to modern medicine and the ability to be proactive, which most athletes in the 80s, 90s and 2000s were reactive. Um, but what you're saying that I want to give a testament to is also part of our history and our first company we started together was a, was a gym, is that the concierge service is for anyone and the privacy that you get is really important because you know, we grow up in a in, um, society that promotes a certain prototype of man and woman. And the reality is each of us are so unique in our food sensitivities, in our workout behaviors, in our stress levels, in our work life, in our family life. And while I'm now on my second glass to your guest first, I at least can account in my own mind my relationship with my Cenogenics coach and being like, okay, right, um, I'm going to do this and it's not the end of the world and here are some things that I have prepared right. to counteract. To counteract, and exactly. And it's sort of, that's the way you move through life. Correct. Yeah. yeah, it's the best way. So on that piece, on our own journeys, one of the things that you guys check for uh, is cortisol levels. So it's a stress uh, hormone uh, and checking that. And um, I was very concerned about my own cortisol levels, thinking they were going to be much higher than they actually were. So that was a huge win. So maybe that means I have some good pain tolerance. You probably do as well. How do you, th and something that I've been talking to a lot of different executives about, um, one of our partners from Whirlpool, their head of marketing is coming in here and we were texting a little bit about you know, her, her stress levels. Um, and we were talking about different practices. Um, how do you think about as a mom, as a wife, as a company leader, managing the stress of all of those things? How do you, do you have any tips for our audience, tips for me and Paul around just stress management and, and how you've been able to, to build this company with all the different responsibilities you have? It's a really great question and um, full transparency. It's, it's one I've battled with right? I think everybody battles with it in some way. I think what I found that has been most helpful is taking, being able to take a step back and recognize that if I don't take care of me, how can I take care of anybody else? It's, it's, it's just not possible. You will just run yourself into the ground and then what, what good is that? You've not helped and, you know, kind of pursued that passion of yours. So, I had to make sure that I make time for myself. So I am very regimented about, I work out four days a week and I do it in the morning and that is my dedicated time. It's blocked on my calendar. I do it. 
I don't always want to do it, <laughs> but I know I need to do it. Um, and if I do that, it kind of sets my head in a really good place for the day and for everything that's to come. And it being on the Cynogenics program, being optimized with all of my levels, really helps me have the energy, the um, you know the sh mental sharpness um, that is needed to kind of just grind day after day. I mean, there's there's you guys know it. You, they're long days, and not getting those breaks is something that is part of you know being a successful individual. Whatever you're doing, you don't you don't always get those breaks. But when life does give you a break, take it. Don't, so so my, my other is I go on vacation, don't do it a lot, but when I go on vacation, I don't work out because those are my breaks. The universe has decided that, you know what, Christy, you get a little bit of time off, but I know when I'm not on vacation, I'm back to my routine and I'm doing what I need to do. And then when you go on vacation, this is, I'm just interested in this, are you fully off or do you still monitor emails? And then my second follow-up question is, how do you think about sleep? And, and, and was, that's yeah, a huge part of a imagine huge part. I was gonna, Yeah, she's laughing. Um, no, <laughs> I, I never, I never unplug. Oh, I, so you're, you're, you're one of those that's like, I'm on vacation, but I'm I still am, responding? I am still responding. I am never unplug. Um, I have gotten better at it over the years. Um, and I think that comes with the confidence in knowing I've got to have me time. I've got to create that so I can be better for my team and better for the organization. But at the end of the day, I don't unplug fully. Um, look, I'm running a very successful organization globally, and there's a lot of demand. So for me personally, I, I just, I don't feel that I can like take that time mm -hmm. off. However, one of your podcasts um, recently, I think you mentioned, you guys take a week off. You like do a blackout we week. Do a full I tell you what, when I heard that, I went, wow, what a concept. Like that's, that's powerful. I mean, it's, and so I'd love to hear from you, like how that's working, but, um, but to get to your second question, yeah, and I'll let you sleep. answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, sleep is, I love sleep. I love sleep. It is so important. So important. It is probably, the probably most important. I was just going to say probably the single most important thing you can do is sleep, get restful sleep. Yeah. And, you know, everybody's different. Some people only need four hours. Other people need 10 hours. You've got to sleep because that's how your body rejuvenates itself. And I've also learned sleep at the right time. That, that was my trial and error with um, an aura ring and a whoop, which, you know, tend to have like slightly, there's like a delta between the two. I have a funny so I got story all, about that. I got overly <laughs> analytical, so I was yeah. like looking at both. But, but really, like the net of it was... Um, my sleep quality is so much better when I go to bed before 10. I could log eight hours from midnight to eight and then six on the other end if I go to bed before 10 and my quality of sleep and my rejuvenation was better when I was before 10. So you, you figure out little things along the way, eating close to bedtime or not, different for each person. Exactly, working out at night versus working out in the morning. Yeah. Everybody's different on how their body responds and I don't want to hijack that your answer here, but or your your what you were saying, but on the the um, aura ring, yeah, it's a great tool, but it's only one tool in the toolbox. You cannot solely depend and rely on what it's great data, yeah. But if you don't couple that with everything else, you're not fully optimizing yourself, and you'll get so caught up that you almost do yourself a disservice. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of meditation apps. That, yeah, like <laughs> their their goal is to uh, in in I an ideal world is to improve our wellness, but they gamify these things, which is servicing their shareholders. I get it, you know, but at the same time, like I'm doing a meditation app and I have a daily streak that's like celebrating. I'm like, this isn't about a streak. It's about me, <laughs> right. you know, this getting Snapchat. time to breathe. <laughs> Um, so, but, but their goal is to keep people on daily and you know, the whoop, what, what was always challenging for me and what athletes now I've learned do is they don't wear it the night before a game mm -hmm. because what you don't want to do is run the risk of waking up and checking and your looking, app and, and it being in, too in stressful. yellow or red Yeah, because it gives, it gives you, it gamifies it. Right. And, and I get it because it encourages you to follow what your body's best with. And they'll go out to the game and feel and like they're going to be stressed. low battery. Yeah. As an yeah. athlete, if you, if you're waking up on game day and your whoop tells you you're 50%, that's yeah. going to fuck it's with you. It's a mess. It will. Yeah. It will. I, it, well, so that's what happened. take it off before games. I would wake up and feel like I felt so rested and I'd look at the data and it said I slept like shit. And I'm yeah. like, 
well, today is going to be you know, right. not a great day yeah. because it was like in my mind. And then, you, and then when you go to bed the next day, you're like stressed. You're going to get a good yeah. night of sleep. Yeah. So my performance health coach goes, stop looking at it like yeah. that. It's trends. Just, it's trends. I mean, how many it's athletes trends. say they don't sleep well before game nights, right? So don't wear your whoop yeah. or your aura ring if that's the case. Yeah. You know, I mean, and the last thing I'll say is what I, what I always use, because we, we partnered with, and, I, and I, like I said, I've used those products, but you know, MJ's uh, now what we've learned as a food poisoning game, you know, 45 points, wins, wins with the Bulls in game six against the Jazz, and like everyone was counting him out. They thought he had the flu. So there's something special about an athlete's charge or their heart that you can't measure, which is probably such a fun relationship that your team has with high performance athletes is you're the data mine, you're helping them, you know, do the day to day and improve. And then when we all step away, including physios and orthopedic surgeons, and you watch an athlete do their job on the field on the on the court, it blows you away. You're like, what the fuck? You know, doesn't make sense sometimes. Exactly, it doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah. yeah. Last last question for me uh, is, how do you how do you think about um, we talk about getting performance and longevity out of your clients, right? And you have. Um, what I've noticed and hopefully what our team and some of the players that have gone through the VO2 max and supplementation orientations that is part of our partnership with Cenogenics, you guys have a great staff, um, chief medical officer and Rafid, and I think hopefully he's coming tonight, but these folks on your staff, whether it's Pete or Seamus, um, true, they're all just great humans from my interact. H how do you think about uh, attracting? What do you look for in someone to work at Cenogenics? What are some characteristics you look for? Um, and, and great, and great uh, colleagues of yours? Um, I really look for people that have that fire in their belly, that passion to continuously be bettering themselves, right? So I want to bring people into my organization that are truly value add. They're, they're not, they're not in it, they're, 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 they're part of the organization, but they're adding such tremendous value from the perspective of coming in with their ideas, feeling like they're empowered to share those ideas. I want people that are smart and that question, like I want, I want you to question what we're doing or why are we doing it this way? Whether it's, you know, at the physician level, you know, why are we giving, you know, this particular therapy when we could be considering X, Y, and Z? Or why are we processing our pharmacy shipments this way? I want people that come in that feel that they can make a difference and they want to make a difference and they want to collaborate and really be part of a family environment. Because it's, it's so easy to try and go at it alone, but you can really go far when you do it together. And I think that people that come in and those individuals you named off and everybody else in the company at Cenogenics really believe um, wholeheartedly in our mission and what we're here to do in helping people. And I think that one of the most proud moments that you know I've had as a CEO and obviously growing up through the company for the last 25 years is our employee tenure is so high. And I think that just speaks volumes to the culture and to bringing in those individuals that feel like they're part of the process, they're part of the program, they're part of the future success, and really driving awareness um, to more and more people about what we do. I love that, so to recap it, so you look for people that are obviously ambitious, smart, um, but have general curiosity that you're gonna be open to their feedback about how to maybe think about and do things differently, and then also people that are gonna be able to collaborate cross-functionally. I mean, it's mentioned, like that's such a big piece of what we think about too. It's like some of the stuff is just like simple blocking and tackling, but it's also feels sometimes like the lessons that where I'm talking to someone, I'm like, they learn it. should learn on a playground. Just get along with this person and like, just have a conversation and then you can move forward. And so collaborations and then I go back to, so I appreciate that advice uh, for me personally. Yeah. And I, I would say it's probably a good place to, to finish this show on togetherness, on family, on, That's on a nice partnership. Rap. That's a nice wrap. Yeah. Because that, that's in the end what we aim to do uh, with our partnerships, um, both on a corporate level with our players, with our investors, with our fans. 
uh, with our colleagues. So this was, uh, this was a special one. It was a first for us to be able to host a partner um, over a glass of wine on a fantastic weekend. We're about to go meet all of the inductees for the Pro Lacrosse Hall of Fame, and we've got the rest of the weekend to look forward to, and thanks for coming. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Christy. Thanks. Thank you.